Hello, so now we're going to begin looking at Jeremiah chapter 29. So this is uh, contains a verse that is uh, very familiar to many people, uh, Jeremiah 29 11. We want to certainly consider that verse, but also look at the entire context of the whole chapter. Um, now, Jeremiah 29 is often referred to as a letter. It's, it's actually not just one letter, though. It's a series of, of three letters that we have. So the first one, uh, letter 1, this is going to be verses 1 through 23. Um, that's going to you know, contain the 2911 that we're familiar with. And then you have letter 2, and that's um, going to be verses 24 through 28. And it has a different person who's being addressed. The first letter is Jeremiah writing to uh, the elders of the exile, the priests, prophets, and to all the people, as it's so named. Uh, the second letter is specifically Jeremiah to a person named Shemaiah. And we'll learn a little bit more about that interaction. And then you have the third letter, which is um, at the very end of the chapter, just 31 through 32. Uh, this is Jeremiah again to the exiles. And these letters are framed by just a little bit of narrative um, that is provided for us to help, help us put these in context. So with that, I want us to get started with reading. Let me pull up the text here for us. Maybe I can make that just a little bit bigger. There we go. And, okay, Jeremiah 29. Um, so we're, we open up again with this framing narrative. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, and I'll just read these first three verses because they all serve as a sort of introduction. So in verse 2, this was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the high officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand, let me scroll this a little, of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying. Okay, so we have some of this background information. We don't have the exact date of the letter, but definitely after the exile of, it says, uh, Jehoiak, or Jeconiah in verse 2. Um, if I can scroll down just a little bit. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, after they'd been sent into exile. So if you remember, Jeconiah is the same as Jehoiakim. Um, so this had been 598, 597, right around that time. Sometime after they had gone into exile, this letter was sent. Um, now we have some a uh, little bit of background information on the letter carriers themselves. Um, Elisa, the son of Shaphan, um, Shaphan had served under Josiah, so Josiah the righteous king. Um, his other son, uh, Ahikam, protected Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 26, verse 24, we read about how, how Ahikam uh, had actually protected Jeremiah. Uh, Shaphan's grandson was Gedaliah, who was the governor of Judah after the exile in 586. So this is generally considered to be a good family, a family that would have been loyal to Jeremiah. Um, and then we have mention of Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah. Now this Hilkiah was probably the same Hilkiah that... Um, participated in the cleaning of the temple under Josiah. So again, these are God-fearing people. These would have been loyal to uh, Jeremiah. Now, they were probably sent from Judah, from Jerusalem, all the way over to Babylon uh, for multiple purposes. Um, they probably were sent, perhaps, to deliver the annual tribute so tribute would have been demanded by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians uh, from Judah, and they would have 
had to have that sent and delivered. These people probably were sent for that reason. They seem to carry some, you know, uh, official role within the government. Um, also to reassure Nebuchadnezzar of uh, the loyalty of Zedekiah. See, Zedekiah and some of the surrounding nations, you read this just a couple chapters back in chapter 27, they had entertained the idea of a rebellion. Um, and, you know, these emissaries, they would have come to Nebuchadnezzar bringing the tribute, but then also to reassure, we are not going to rebel. Um, please don't invade, don't attack us again. Okay? That's just a little bit of background information, and now we get into the substance of the letter. So verse 4 here, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles whom I, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay, now a few things I want to point out here. Um, one, note this use of uh, a very full form of the messenger formula. This is what the Lord of Armies, uh, Yahweh Tzabaoth, the Lord of Armies, the God of Israel, says. Okay, so this is the first occurrence of the messenger formula within the context of this letter in the very full form. Now, Jeremiah then makes a point. This is what God is saying to the exiles whom I have sent. Who's I? It's God, whom God has sent. Um, he's making the point that the exile, and this is something that the people are having to wrestle with. If you remember, like, this whole, you know, the whole business with Shiloh and the temple sermon and this idea that the inviability of, of Jerusalem and of the temple, and here we have God saying he is the one who, who caused the exile to happen. It is Yahweh's doing that the exile happened. So nations... And, you know, I think we've mentioned this briefly. Um, nations and warfare was uh, viewed as a battle between national gods. When one nation and another nation went to war against one another, um, what they imagined was that that the earthly battle was a reflection of the heavenly battle that was happening between these different deities. And so for Babylon, the you know, the national god of Babylon, Marduk, would have been going to war with Yahweh. This is how people, you know, conceived warfare in the ancient world. And for Judah and Jerusalem, they would have seen this as, well, Yahweh is the one who created everything. Um, so surely he is going to be victorious. We cannot lose. Um, at least that's the way that they perceived it. Um, for them to have been sent into exile would have indicated maybe Marduk is stronger than Yahweh. But then that's that goes against like their basic beliefs that Yahweh is the God who created everything. So now here comes the point is that no, Marduk didn't beat Yahweh. Yahweh sent you into exile. Um, so Jeremiah is emphasizing this point. This exile is actually Yahweh's doing. This is a major theme uh, in the book of in the book of Jeremiah, and so we continue from there. In verse five: Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. So, think for a minute where you've heard that language before. Build houses, plant gardens, building and planting. Okay, this uh, hopefully. You're recognizing it from Jeremiah's commission all the way back in chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, we read God is commissioning Jeremiah and he says, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Okay, but here... This is actually the command is given for those who are currently in Babylon. Um, this is, remember, this is a letter sent to those who have been taken in this first of the major exiles in 598, 597. And Jeremiah is telling them, build and plant. This is part of the, the prophetic commission that was given to him. And he continues this in the same vein in verse 6. 
It says, take wives and father sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may give birth to sons and daughters and grow in number there and do not decrease. In other words, live in Babylon like you would at home. You know, build a family. Now, this is, honestly, this kind of reminds me of um, what was happening with the Israelites when they were in a previous captivity, when they were in, enslaved in Egypt. And the biblical text draws a lot of parallels between uh, captivity in Egypt and captivity in Babylon, and a lot of parallels of, of how God's going to deliver his people. But Remember what happened while they were in captivity in Egypt. They increased in number. They, you know, they grew. And here God's saying, now you're in a new captivity. But God still wants them to grow. God still wants them to increase in number as, you know, again, part of this divine mandate that that God gives to them. And then just continuing on, on verse 7 here, scroll this up. So verse 7. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord in its uh, in its behalf, for in its prosperity will be your prosperity. Okay, now the people are supposed to pray on behalf of Babylon, those who have, you know, captured them, taken them from their homes, brought them into exile and, and utter humiliation, and now they're supposed to pray for its for a blessing on it. This is not very different um, from the words of Jesus in, in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you know, I, Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, it's a very similar kind of uh, ethic at work here. Um, now, notice the repetition of this word, prosperity. Um, seek the prosperity. And if you do know a little Hebrew, you can see it highlighted over there. It is the word shalom. Okay? Let's see. Ah. Sorry, I'm off to the side. Did I fit it all in? Okay, I fit it all in. So, shalom, okay? This is often translated as, as peace. This really has a wide range of, of meanings and usage. Uh, it can mean prosperity. Um, the basic sense of the, of the word is for something to be whole or to be complete. Um, so it sometimes is translated as success, um, you know, peace, you know, things are, are whole and complete. And so it could be peace as opposed to war. Um, it could be a personal state of wholeness. Um, in other words, to be healthy. All of these things, he's, you know, he's saying, you know, pray for this shalom for the city where, where you're being sent into exile. Pray for the city to be whole and have peace and, and to prosper and have success and be healthy um, because its peace, its shalom will be your shalom. And your your shalom is bound to the shalom of Babylon. Okay? So now they're they're he's God is changing their orientation. If you remember, um, or at least trying to, uh, Israel was meant to be a light to the Gentiles around them. But they hadn't been a light to the Gentiles around them. Instead of, you know, showing them and, and teaching them how to worship the one true God, they instead engaged in the same idolatry that these other nations were engaged in. And, and you know, God is, is trying to, to shift their, their orientation and, and help them to see that it's not just them against the nations of the world, but, you know, they, they need to... Um, they need to seek the shalom, the peace of these other nations, because their own fate is bound up with this. It's a very different orientation for the people. And then, let's see, we continue into verse 8. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Okay, second messenger formula, right? 
We had the first one opening up the letter. Um, and again, this is in a very full form. Uh, the Lord of armies, the God of Israel. Yahweh Tzabaoth Elohei Yisrael. Um, so very full form. And now he begins to highlight the false prophets. He says, Do not let your prophets who are in your midst or your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to their interpretations of your dreams, which you dream. So he's addressing, uh, talking about the pro- these false prophets that would deceive that are in Babylon with the people. They're, they're there in exile with them. And notice he's highlighting these different forms of, of divination. You know, it's not just the, the prophets, um, you, you know, the prophets who are in your midst or your diviners who deceive you um, and who, you know, who are interpreting these dreams. These people seem to be more, if you remember talking about the different types of prophets and the roles that prophets played, these seem to be more prophetic propagandists, um, like state prophets that were upholding the policies of Zedekiah the king at this time. That's what it seems like is going on here. And then he continues in verse 9, For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Okay, so again, One of the major roles of a prophet is this role as a messenger, that they have been sent, commissioned by God, and they have been in his presence, and God sends them out. And that's reflected in the use of this messenger formula, which here, in verse 9, we get it for the third time, now in a very short form, declares the Lord. And now God is saying of these false prophets, they have not been in my presence, and I did not send them out. Okay? So... They, they are, uh, in fact, false prophets. And then we get to verse 10. And look, once again, another messenger formula. For this is what the Lord says. Um, so again, indicating this speech from God. And he says, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Um, now, Jeremiah gives a timeline here of 70 years. Um, This is much longer than the false prophet Hananiah's prediction of a two-year exile. So actually, let's just look back up here in Jeremiah 28. Okay, so here in Jeremiah 28, we have Hananiah, the prophet... Um, who was speaking, and he says, uh, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. So he's, he's giving the messenger formula, and he says, within two years, I'm going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. So Hananiah says two years, and so you have this, you know, these group of prophets that are there in Babylon among the exiles, and they're saying, look, this is going to be over before you can even, you know, learn the lay of the land. We're just, we're going to be going back in just a couple of years. And now you compare this to Jeremiah 29 in verse 10, when 70 years have been completed. So much, much longer time that we're dealing with this. Um, now, this section of, of Jeremiah um, 26 through 29, is continuing this theme of judgment that God has, but we're going to start to see some hope intermingled in with this judgment. There's a, there's a bit of a shift. If you remember, uh, you know, chapters 2 through 25 was just judgment, 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 just all the time. It's very, very hard. Now we're beginning to see some hope intermingled in with this. Now, in terms of what exactly the 70 years are referring to, um, there have been some attempts to interpret the 70-year timeline. Uh, Some of these attempts have been literal. Some of them have been figurative. Um, So some people say that the 70 years began in the year 605. 
you know, what exactly, because there was this, the exile that happened in the year 605, a small exile, that would have been the one that Daniel was in. Um, others say that it began in this 598, 597 time. Um, others say it began in 586, when that was the destruction of the temple and the, the total destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and the ending... Well, there's a couple possibilities for when people would say the ending is. One would be the year 539. 539 was the year that um, uh, Cyrus of Persia came in and conquered Babylon and commanded that all those who had been exiled by Babylon should return to their homelands, including Israel. They returned in 539 and began that process. Um, Others say that it actually ended in the year 516 uh, because that is when the temple was completed. When the temple was rebuilt, it was completed in the year 516. Um, you know, some people, you know, they see it as a very clear, like, the temple, the 70 years refers to the destruction of the temple in 586. 70 years from there, you're at 516 and the completion of the rebuilding of the temple. Um, these are just some of the ways people have, have taken it. Uh, again, other people have taken it more figuratively um, to su- just to suggest that it's the length of an ordinary life. Um, in other words, you know, when, when Jeremiah says, uh, you know, when 70 years have been completed, he's basically saying, uh, do not expect to return to Jerusalem. You are going to die in Babylon. Okay, that's like that's kind of more the figurative uh, sense of what's of what's happening there. I don't think there's any way to clearly resolve what exactly is going on. I think you can say at least that figurative sense. That's the overall tone. You know, when he's saying build houses, plant vineyards, um, have children and have grandchildren and, you know, marry them off to one another. He the definite sense that you have is that you are not, Jeremiah is telling to the exiles, you are not going to return. This is going to be a permanent exile for you. Um, And then he continues on, um, you know, and well, in verse 10 there, you know, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you. Okay. Now, this word uh, visit, this is worth doing um, a little bit of a Bible uh, word study here um, on this. The, the Hebrew word is pakad, uh, pakad, and it's used a number of times by Jeremiah. So give me one sec. I'm going to pull up Blue Letter Bible. Okay, so I just pulled up Blue Letter Bible here. <clears throat> so you can go to this website. Um, I set the text to the New American Standard Bible, 1995, um, and I've gone to, let's see, Jeremiah 29.10. So I just need to click on the button right next to that, and that gives me the Hebrew text right below it. If you don't know Hebrew, that is okay, because you can just go down and you can see um, the terms that are... um, you know, how they're translated from Hebrew in to English. And the word we are looking at is this one um, translated as visit, pakad. And you can just click on, um, you can highlight it there um, where it says 6485. You just click on that Strong's number. Now that's going to bring us to this next page that's going to give us, you know, sort of a lexical entry for the word pakad. Um, different ways that it's it's being translated. What we want to look at, though, specifically is how this is used in Jeremiah. That's that's going to be a really useful way for us to um, to conduct this word study. Um, so I'm just going to scroll down, and now I have okay the concordance results. The word it's used quite a bit in the Old Testament occurs 304 times within 269 verses. Um, so that is that is quite a bit. Um, certainly do not need to analyze every single one of those, um, especially for an undergraduate paper. But um, you can scroll down. I'm just going to zoom right on down to the bottom where I have 
let's see, the search results. So I am going to go to this fifth one because this is going to tell me it's covering everything from Isaiah 27 through the end of Jeremiah. So I'll click on there. Because again, I just want to get to the results that deal with Jeremiah. And I'm going to scroll down. And here we have in Jeremiah 1.10. Now just to get an appreciation for the way this term is being used. Jeremiah 1.10, uh, this word pakad, to, to visit, um, is used, it's translated as appointed. See, I have appointed you this day. Um, over the nations and over the kingdoms. So that's, um, you know, to pakad could mean to appoint someone, you know, that you would set them so that they would be doing the God's visiting them so that then they would be in this in this position. Um, the next one, okay, this is um, translated, he's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, and, you know, it says, you know, of the people, it says they... It will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it. This is probably just the sense of literally to visit it. Like they're not even going to, they're not even going to think about visiting it. They're not, it doesn't come to their mind. They don't remember it. They're not going to visit it. Um, and they're not going to remake it. Nothing like that. Now this is where it gets a little more interesting. Jeremiah 5 verse 9. Shall I not punish? Okay, here's different usage here. Um, to, for God to punish people is literally saying he will visit them. Shall I not visit these people? In other words, punish them? You know, and he continues there, on a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? And here, we're just going to see this repeated quite a bit. Jeremiah 6.6, 6, this is the city to be visited, or this is the city to be punished, to be pakad. Um, 6.15, at that time I will punish them. 9.9, 9, shall I not punish them for these things? 9.25, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Jeremiah 11.22, behold, I am about to punish them. I am about to visit them. Okay? Here's another use of it in 1321, translating it more as appoints to, you know, God has appointed. Um, when will you say he appoints over you? Uh, what? Sorry, what will you say when he appoints over you? And you yourself had taught them. So you have that. Um, you can continue through and you can analyze all these usages. Um, but again, notice over and over again, 2114, punish. Um, let's see. Uh, 20, or 2334, again, bringing punishment. 2512, punish. 278, punish. Um, but now we have 29.10. It says, for, the, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit them. But this time it's not translated as punish. This time it's God is going to visit you and fulfill his good word to you, to bring you back to this place. So, God is again promising he's going to pakad, he's going to visit his people, but this time we're beginning to see more of that, that hope of a restoration. That pakad is not any longer just God punishing, but this is pakad, God visiting to restore his people. And literally he says, um, <coughs> excuse me, let me go back to, yeah. Okay, he says, I will visit you and fulfill my good word. Oh, sorry. I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. In other words, like literally it's saying to cause you to return. Um, Jeremiah has been pleading with the people, and we've talked about this word before. Um, Jeremiah has been pleading with the people to shuv right if you remember this 
to return, to repent, to go, to return to God. And Jeremiah has been pleading with the people to do just that. Um, now it's saying God is literally going to cause them to shuv. He's going to cause the people to return. In other words, to bring them back to the land, which being back in the land, that, that's a symbol of people of God's people in covenant with him. God's people in covenant with Yahweh is symbolized by their living in and dwelling in the land which he had promised to their forefathers. And then we get to Jeremiah 29, 11, which of course you know, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Messenger formula number five. Now at this point, in very short form, declares the Lord. Um, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for, there's that word again, prosperity. This is shalom, if you remember back from verse seven. Plans for prosperity, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So during the exile, the people's prosperity, the people's shalom is tied to Babylon. Now at the conclusion of the exile, the people's shalom is instead tied to Yahweh's plans. You know, after the 70, you know, during the 70 year time, their shalom is tied to Babylon. Now, at the conclusion of the exile, God is going to pakad, he is going to visit his people to fulfill his good word because he has these plans and these plans for shalom and now their shalom is tied directly to God. Okay, if you see that transition that's happening here. And he says he's going to give them a future and a hope. Um, now, earlier in, in, um, in Jeremiah, the future was seen in a very negative light. Um, now, the future is seen as something that's positive. And actually, this uh, this expression, he's going to give them a future and a hope. This is probably a type of a figure of speech that is sometimes called, uh, sorry, let me, yeah, hen, dia, sorry, dis. That's one word, hendiadis, okay? Uh, a hendiadis is a type of figure of speech where you have a single concept conveyed by two words that are linked together with a conjunction. So this is used a lot in Hebrew. This is even used in English. Um, here's just a simple example, um, the expression sound and fury, um, sound and fury. Um, that is an example of a hendiadis where what you're meaning is a furious sound. Okay, so it's a single concept conveyed by two words linked together by a conjunction, um, one through two. Okay, that's hendiadis. So um, here we have a future and a hope. In other words, it's a hopeful future. That's, you kind of put them together into one single concept. Before, the future was very negative. Now, you have a hopeful future that you can look forward to. Um, and then, just continuing right along in verse 12, then you will call upon me. Uh, there we go. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Now, calling upon God while in captivity. Um, this is a biblical theme. Solomon and his covenantal prayer um, at the dedication of the temple. You can read this. Second Chronicles uh, 6, verses 36 through 39. Um, he reflects this. In captivity in Egypt, the people, they, they called out to God. Um, you can read that Exodus 2. 23 and 24, and Daniel in captivity. In Daniel 9, 3, we see that Daniel in captivity was calling out to God. That is a, a biblical theme. And so that's reflected here, Jeremiah 29, 12. They will call upon me and, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to them. And then uh, 29... Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Um, 
this is uh, echoing language from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, 4, which maybe I can go ahead and pull this up. Deuteronomy uh, 4, 26, uh, really through 29, you know, he says, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that you will quickly perish from the land where you are going over the Jordan to take possession of it. You will not live long on it, but will be utterly destroyed. This is if they, if they sin, if they don't follow Torah. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you there. You will serve God's the work of human hands. This is just the wrong verse. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, no. There it is. There it is. I'm sorry. I just lost it. I lost myself for a second. Okay. There you will serve gods, the work of human hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell or, nor eat nor smell anything. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's what's reflected here in Jeremiah um, 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This is what God is saying. When you are in captivity, when you seek God, and this this idea of, of seeking him with all your heart, this is not just a reference to emotional desire, like the idea of like just this fervent emotional passion of seeking God, although that can certainly be a part of it. Emotions can certainly play into it. But the idea is that, you know, when you seek God with all your heart, you're seeking him with all your energy, with all your being, with all that you are. Um, And certainly we see this, you know, in this, an allusion to the Shema, which... Sorry, the Shema, again, in Deuteronomy. Um, Here, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, just with everything you have. You seek God. And that's, I mean, that idea is what's reflected here in Jeremiah 29, verse 13, is this idea of seeking God with everything that you have, not just merely emotional passion. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's let me go back to Jeremiah 29. Now in verse 14, I will let myself be found by you, declares the Lord. Okay, and there's number six messenger formula. I will let myself be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you declares the Lord. There's number seven, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Um, So when the people seek God with all their heart, God will bless them with the covenant blessings, with the sanctions, you know, this promise that he is going to return, restore the people, restore their fortunes. I'm sorry, I just, I have to. We've, We've got to keep looking back at Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy verse or chapter 30, um, just reading these first few verses here. So it will be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have placed before you. So I'm talking about in the future. This is Moses to the people of Israel before the um, conquest of the promised land. Um, and you call them to mind and all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. So you recall these sanctions, you recall God's promises, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul in accordance with everything that I am am commanding you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of your countrymen are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. It's this promise of of restoration. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will be good to you and make you more numerous than your fathers. 
okay? So this is the promise of this restoration um, that is constantly in the back of the mind of these people who are in exile, this promise, this hope that, that God would, would visit them in, in the good way. God would visit them in the good way and restore them back. Okay, um, let's see. Ooh, we're going long here. Uh, I apologize, but there's just a lot of good stuff here. So Jeremiah 29... Okay, picking up in verse 15. V- verse 15 is going to begin an argument that concludes um, at, at verse 21. Okay, it's a somewhat complex structure. There's, you know, verses 16, 17, 18, 19 are kind of a digression from the main central argument that begins in verse 16. But we're going to try to follow this along here. Um, so now, verse 15, because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us, in Babylon, okay? Um, So again, this section um, that we're in, 26 through 29, the main theme that is, you know, kind of the the glue that's holding these chapters together is Jeremiah's confrontations with false prophets. That's what is playing out here. And here, Jeremiah is having confrontations, and, you know, it's it's happening through this this, uh, correspondence. So, highlighting that confrontation. The Lord has raised up for us prophets in Babylon. In other words, these false prophets, but these people might be holding, hanging on to their words. Okay, and then verse 16. Um, For this is what the Lord says concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who live in the city, your brothers who did not go with you into exile. So now Jeremiah is redirecting the exile's attention to those who are in Judah, you know, concerning those people who were not exiled. And again, another messenger formula Um, there. Uh, in verse 16, for this is what the Lord says, short short uh, form of a messenger formula. Um, so this is what the Lord says concerning the king, the one who's still in Jerusalem, and concerning all the people who still live in this city. In verse 17, this is what the Lord of army says, another messenger formula. Behold, I am sending upon them the sword, famine, and plague, and I will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten due to rottenness. Let me scroll this up a little bit. Okay, so these people who have not yet been exiled, they are still going to be punished. That's what Jeremiah is saying. They're they're going to get what is coming to them. And then notice, you know, that he says, I will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten due to rottenness. This is certainly recalling Jeremiah uh, chapter 24, where Jeremiah has this vision of of figs. Uh, The good figs are those that are in exile, and the bad figs are those that remain in Judah. So 24, you can read about that. The good figs, verses 5 through 7. The bad figs, verses 8 through 10. Okay, and so now he's saying this is, you know, this is what they're going to become like. Okay, continuing right along, verse 18, I will pursue them. Again, the people who are not in exile will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with the plague, and I will make them an object of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an object of horror and hissing and a disgrace among all the nations where I have driven them. So this triad that we've we see before, um, sword, famine, plague, this triad of of punishments. Um, you know, this is uh, repeated from from the uh, from the previous verse. Sorry, verse 17, sending upon them the sword, famine, and plague. Verse 18, pursue them with the sword, famine, and plague. It's in the vision of the figs, in uh, chapter 24, verse 10. It's in chapter 14. This is just frequently occurs. Um, and then we continue along, verse 19, in this digression. Let's see, verse 19. Okay, because they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord messenger formula again, which I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets, but you did not listen, declares the Lord. Okay, this is the end of the digression. Those who remain behind are still getting 
punished, and those who are in exile are actually in the better position. They are the ones who are like, they're the fortunate ones, basically. Those are the good figs. Um, man, and another messenger formula there at the end of, of 19. So 19, because you have not, they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord. And then again, closing out the verse, declares the Lord. Okay? Now, and then, let's see, verse 20. You, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles, whom I have sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay? So, again, this, this main argument that begins in verse 15 you know, the people said, uh, they've said that the God has raised up for them prophets in Babylon. Now, God is is kind of dealing with all this at once. <clears throat> okay, verse 20 then. Yeah, you therefore hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles whom I've sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So now he's redirecting his address back to the exiles. And then verse 21 this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says concerning Ahab, the son of Koliah, and concerning Zedekiah, the son of Maaseah, who are prophesying to you falsely in my name. So now he's saying, okay, this is what God has to say about these false prophets. Um, and of course, we have the messenger formula again. Um, he says, Behold, I'm going to hand them over to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will kill them before your eyes. So these false prophets are going to be killed. They um, likely were repeating the similar uh, false prophecies as Hananiah, who said that the exile is going to be over within two years. So you've got these people there among the exiles in Babylon saying, you know, this thing's going to be over God's going to rescue us and send us back. And Jeremiah is saying, look, the ones who are here in, in Judah still are the bad figs. You who are in exile are the good figs. And moreover, those who are prophesying that you're just going to come back, no, no, I, those people are going to be punished. They're going to be killed uh, for repeating these false prophets. Okay, let's see. How much more do we have here? Okay. Now, in, uh, let's see, in the next verse, verse 22 here, let me make sure I'm, scroll up a little, okay. God's going to kill, he's going to punish these, um, these false prophets, and it says, because of them, a curse will be used by all the exile from Judah who are in Babylon, saying, may the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. In other words, like, their names are going to become like a, like a proverb, um, this roasting and the fire, this is a punishment that had been used in Babylon for a very long time. Um, this is mentioned all the way back in the Hammurabi Law Code in lines 25, 110, and 157, this punishment of roasting someone in the fire. And of course, it's prominently used in Daniel chapter 3, um, roasting people in fire as a form of punishment. And Jeremiah is saying that's what's going to happen to these false prophets, and it's going to become like a like a curse that you would say, you know, may you become like these two false prophets. Because, verse 23, because they acted foolishly in Israel and committed adultery with their neighbors' wives and falsely spoke words in my name, which I did not command them, I am he who knows and a witness, declares the Lord. So this idea of uh, committing adultery, frequently this is used as a metaphor in the prophets um, to describe unfaithfulness and idolatry. You know, committing adultery is frequently a metaphor for idolatry. Um, but here, you know, the fact that it's, it just doesn't say, you know, committing adultery. It says committing adultery with their neighbor's wives. This seems to indicate that this might be more literal adultery that's going on here. Um, 
And notice how God says, uh, I am he who knows and a witness. This is reflecting this sort of legal indictment that God is referring to himself as a witness. He's, you know, this is a... almost has you know this uh, impression of being like a legal trans, uh, a legal indictment this covenant transgression that the people are are seeing here and again messenger formula declares the lord this is the 13th time within that we're now at the conclusion of that first letter um, through the first 23 verses um, Ask yourself, why are there so many messenger formulas? This is, this is a very dense with messenger formulas within this short letter. Um, you know, ask yourself, why? Why would there be so many? Um, perhaps one idea um, is that the high frequency of using messenger formulas indicates a high level of opposition to the prophet and his message. Here he is, you know, they're hearing these other people telling him these prophecies, you're going to return back within just two years. And Jeremiah is saying, no, no, you're never going to return back. You're going to die. You're going to die in Babylon. You're never going to come back. You're never going to see the temple again. You're never going to see Jerusalem again. Go ahead and build your house. God still wants to restore you, but it's, it's going to be your children. It's going to be your grandchildren. Um, those are the ones who are going to be restored. And that message might have been, I would imagine, met with a certain level of opposition. People didn't like that. Um, And so Jeremiah is just constantly reinforcing, declares the Lord, this is what God has said. This is not just Jeremiah the curmudgeon. This is God's word to you. This is what he's predicted is going to happen. Now, in verse... 24, we begin the second of these letters. Um, So let me pull these up here. Okay. Uh, So Jeremiah 29, verse 24. Now you shall speak to Shemaiah the Nehemite, saying, This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Um, So according to later on um, in in this chapter, in verse 31, uh, Shemaiah is a false prophet. Um, apparently, uh, this person had sent letters from Babylon to Jerusalem in response to Jeremiah's letter. So Jeremiah sends this letter, you know, calling out these false prophets, saying, you know, build houses, plant vineyards, have children, you're going to live and you're going to die in Babylon, but God is going to eventually restore his people from Babylon. Uh, but that's going to come at a much later time. Shemaiah then sent a letter to to Jerusalem in response to this, and now Jeremiah is addressing this um, So, verse 25, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says, because you have sent letters in your own name to all the people who are in Jerusalem and to the priest Zephaniah, the son of Maaseah, and to all the priests, saying, the Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada, the priest, to be overseer of the house of the Lord for every insane person who prophesies to put him in the stocks and in the iron collar. Okay. There's a bit going on here, and we'll, we'll continue this. Zephaniah, uh, apparently a person of, of some position of authority. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 52, he's mentioned as, um, you know, second priest, just this, this title of authority. And he says, okay, um, where, he's, where he says, you have sent letters in your own name. Perhaps when Jeremiah indicates this, um, because you have sent letters in your own name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, it's an indication that Shemaiah's letter was not in Yahweh's name. Jeremiah repeatedly is sending his letters, declares the Lord, declares the Lord. This is God's message to the people. Shemaiah is speaking. Perhaps this is what Jeremiah is indicating. He's saying, you know, you're speaking out of your own name instead of God's name. So, and here then... Um, Jeremiah then quotes in verse 26, he quotes Shemaiah, what he was saying. Um, So Shemaiah is reminding Zephaniah, this priest, of his responsibility to censure 
every, you know, quote, insane person who prophesies. You know, there you have, in verse 26, the Lord has made you priest to be overseer of the house for every insane person who prophesies to put him in the stocks and in the iron collar. So he's, this is what Shemaiah is saying, you know, this is your responsibility. So then, verse 27, again, this is Shemaiah, Jeremiah's quoting Shemaiah's letter. So now, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anathoth, who prophesies to you, seeing as he has sent word to us in Babylon, saying, the exile will be long, build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Okay, so he's, Shemaiah, you know, hears, reads, more likely hears Jeremiah's letter, and he says this is this is all wrong, and so he sends a letter back to Jerusalem and says, hey, you've got to do something about this Jeremiah guy. You've got to punish him. He's just like some insane person prophesying, um, at least as, as how he's how he's representing Jeremiah, um, and, you know, showing that he's directly responding to Jeremiah, okay? Now in verse 29, we begin to get, um, well, first introducing Jeremiah's third letter. So now, Jeremiah 29, 29, Zephaniah the priest read this letter to Jeremiah the prophet. So Jeremiah sends a letter to Jerusalem, you know, saying Jeremiah is insane, and they say, hey, Jeremiah, you look at this letter. Look at what this guy says about you. So he reads this letter to Jeremiah the prophet. Um, probably he's an al- he's an ally of Jeremiah. That's that's my guess, anyways, because there's no attempt no attempt to imprison Jeremiah as Shemaiah requested. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, and then this is uh, let's see, verse thirty one. Send word to all the exiles, saying, This is what the Lord says concerning Shemaiah the Nehelamite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, although I did not send him, and he has made you trust in a lie. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, Behold, I am going to punish Shemaiah the Nehelamite and his descendants. He will not have anyone living among his people, and he will not see the good that I am going to do for my people, declares the Lord, because he has spoken falsely against the Lord. Okay, so then Jeremiah sends this letter addressing Shemaiah. Um, He says, you know, this is what the Lord says concerning. So Jeremiah is emphasizing, indicating that he is conveying Yahweh's word regarding Shemaiah. Um, And, of course, he's saying, I did not send him. So God, and then in closing this, he still yet again reinforces his intention, his plan to bring good to the people. You know, Shemaiah is not going to see it, but God is going to bring good to his people as he's intended, as he's planned to do. Shemaiah is not going to participate because he has been a false prophet. Okay? So that concludes our little discussion of Jeremiah chapter 29.